Well, thank you, Kevin, and thank you to uh, the Heritage Foundation for inviting me here today, and congratulations on the publication of the 2023 Index of Military Strength, which is an incredible accomplishment. Dakota and the entire team here, you should be very proud. Although I have to say that I don't know what was more depressing, uh, watching my Green Bay Packers lose to the New York Jets, which I didn't even know was a professional football team until I was there on Sunday, or reading this year's Military Index, which for the first time in the history of the Heritage Index downgrades the overall rating of the U.S. military. It's now weak. Uh, reading the index, I thought to myself, you know, it sure would be nice if we didn't have to spend all this money on military strength in pursuit of peace. But here's the problem. We've tried everything else, and none of it seems to work. For example, at the height of utopianism that characterized the interwar period, the Senate actually attempted to outlaw war by ratifying the Kellogg-Briand Pact on January 16, 1929. The only no vote was actually Wisconsin Senator John Blaine, who, as the author of the 21st Amendment, must have understood that outlawing war would work about as well as outlawing alcohol. Blaine subsequently lost his Senate seat. He was censured by the Wisconsin state legislature for his vote, while Secretary Kellogg won the Nobel Peace Prize. But just a few years later, signatories, including Japan, Germany, Austria, Italy, violated the treaty, eventually leading to World War II. In fact, today, war remains outlawed. And yet war persists because these same utopian delusions persist. Consider President Biden at the U.N. last fall, wish casting that we were closing an era of relentless war, an opening one of relentless diplomacy in which, quote, many of our greatest concerns cannot be solved or even addressed by the force of arms. Or days before Vladimir Putin's latest invasion of Ukraine, Biden's special presidential envoy for climate, John Kerry, expressing his confusion about the looming invasion, saying, I thought we lived in a world that had said no to that kind of activity. Meanwhile, senior State Department officials projected their enlightened sensibilities onto Putin, scolding him that instead of invading Ukraine, he should focus on building back better. Or consider the Biden administration's national defense strategy, the cornerstone of which is a concept called integrated deterrence. Beneath the jargon, the basic idea is that we can de-emphasize hard power, yet still bolster deterrence by better integrating soft power, allies, and technology into military operations. But here's the issue. While the Pentagon is talking about doing less, the rest of the interagency is not talking about doing more. If you examine the strategic plans released this year by the Departments of State, Treasury, Commerce, the term integrated deterrence is nowhere to be found. Thus, it fails on its own terms. Yet, the administration has gone farther, deluding itself into thinking that integrated deterrence succeeded in Ukraine. Barely one month into the war, anonymous Pentagon officials bravely bragged to the Washington Post that integrated deterrence comes out smelling pretty good from this. Yet tens of thousands of dead Ukrainians, millions more displaced, should not smell, look, or feel good. A Post profile lauding Austin's application of integrated deterrence in Ukraine included Under Secretary of Defense for Policy Colin Call boasting that, quote, we are literally defying the laws of bureaucratic physics by how fast we're going in Ukraine. Now, I, I'm a Marine, not a physicist, but Newton's first law of motion states that an object in motion will stay in motion unless acted upon by an external force. And on February 24th, 2022, deterrence failed in Ukraine because, as Putin put his invasion plans into motion, President Biden repeatedly signaled 
that he would not put American hard power in Putin's way. The president preemptively pulled American troops out of Ukraine, abandoned our embassy, sent our ships sailing out of the Black Sea, even seemed to greenlight a minor incursion. The administration went so far as to limit the pre-war transfer of defense equipment out of a fear that it might provoke Putin. Instead, the Biden administration largely relied on the threat of sanctions and sternly worded statements to deter Putin, and deterrence disintegrated at the cost of tens of thousands of lives, hundreds of billions of dollars, and increasing threats of nuclear escalation. Eventually, after we went back and forth on the House Armed Services Committee in a hearing, Secretary Austin and Chairman Milley actually admitted that integrated deterrence failed in Ukraine, and that, quote, short of the commitment of U.S. military forces into Ukraine proper, Putin was not deterrable. This was an important, if inadvertent, admission about the supremacy of hard power in matters of deterrence, one that has profound implications for how we deter a war with China over Taiwan. For when it comes to Taiwan, time is not on our side. We have entered the window of maximum danger, or the Davidson window, which is a reference to former Indo-Pacific commander Phil Davidson's assessment that China may make a move on Taiwan within the next five years. Divesting of hard power within the Davidson window is dangerous. And yet the Biden administration insists on doing just that. The Biden defense budget would force the Navy to bottom out at 280 ships and the Air Force to cut over 1,000 airplanes by 2027, just in time for the PLA's 100th anniversary and target date for having the capability to take Taiwan. Most of the transformative technology that DOD is investing in with its much hype 9.5% increase in the research and development uh, budget from hypersonic weapons to Joint All Domain Command and Control, or JADC2, may not be fielded until the 2030s, if at all. Making matters worse, we are running low on the munitions that are essential to both Ukraine and Taiwan. Two months into the war, we had already sent Ukraine a quarter of our entire Stinger stockpile and more than seven years worth of javelins. Now, admittedly, some people think I'm too pessimistic and think that the 69-year-old Xi Jinping, who this week is securing a third term as general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party, will abandon his lifelong ambition of taking Taiwan. But look at what he's just recently gotten away with. Hong Kong, genocide, covering up a coronavirus pandemic that's killed at least six million people globally. Furthermore, she's problems. Structural economic slowdown, skyrocketing household debt, the demographic buzzsaw of dealing with more retirees than any society in human history all get worse in the 2030s. Why would he wait? We must not gamble the fate of the free world on Xi's restraint, nor on our own utopian delusions that somehow we've evolved beyond wars of territorial expansion. We must put American hard power in Xi's path before it's too late. While long-term investments to rebuild American military superiority in general and maritime superiority in particular are critical the reality is we will not be able to build the Navy the nation needs in the next five years. But what we can do within the Davidson window, however, is build an anti-Navy. And by anti-Navy, I mean asymmetric forces and weapons designed to target the Chinese Navy, deny control of the seas surrounding Taiwan, and prevent PLA amphibious forces from gaining a lodgment on the island. The first step in building this anti-Navy does not actually require us to defy any laws of physics, bureaucratic or otherwise, though technically it is rocket science. 
Now that we are no longer bound by the INF Treaty, we can surge long-range conventional precision fires in three concentric rings across the Pacific. The first island chain, the second island chain, plus the Central Pacific Islands, and the outer edges of the theater, including Alaska, Hawaii, and Australia. In the first, range, the first ring, we need shorter range anti-ship and air defense missiles, such as the Naval Strike Missile, Long Range Anti-Ship Missile, and SM-6. These weapons will be operated by Army and Marine Corps stand-in forces, especially in the southern Japanese and northern Philippine islands, and wherever possible, they should be containerized so as to confuse Chinese targeting. In the second ring, we need extended range maritime strike tomahawks and other intermediate range missiles. And in the third ring, we need longer range intermediate missiles with advanced energetic materials in places like Alaska and Australia's Northern Territory. The point is that the PLA rocket force, which is China's anti-Navy, has fielded low cost weapons to keep American ships out of the fight and target American forces concentrated in a few fixed locations. We must use this same logic against them. Building an anti-Navy that can sink PLA ships and amphibious landing craft in port, in the strait, and on Taiwan's beaches. The second step in building an anti-Navy is to stockpile munitions before the shooting starts. That's one of the big lessons of Ukraine. At current production rates, for example, it will take at least two years to boost Javelin production from 2,100 to 4,000 missiles annually. And in many cases, Chinese companies are the sole source or a primary supplier for the energetic materials that are used in our missiles. To fix this, the Pentagon should stop buying minimum sustaining rates of critical munitions and start maxing out the capacity of active production lines through multi-year procurement contracts. Drawing on the lessons of Operation Warp Speed, we can also modernize the Defense Production Act and use it to provide direct project financing, automatic fast-tracking of permits, and investments in defense workforce training. Consider that when I first deployed to Iraq in 2007, most Marines were still riding around in, in highly vulnerable Humvees. And then when I returned in 2008, as if by magic, suddenly we all had MRAPs. But of course it wasn't magic. It was because Secretary Gates made fielding them his highest acquisition priority. The next Secretary of Defense must similarly make rebuilding our munitions industrial base a personal crusade. Now the third and final step in building uh, this anti-Navy is to turn all of the talk about arming Taiwan to the teeth into reality. This starts with moving Taiwan to the front of the foreign military sales line and clearing the backlog of $14 billion worth of FMS items that have been approved but not delivered to Taiwan. Congress can go even further by providing direct financial assistance to Taiwan and by giving the Pentagon the same drawdown authority to directly provide defense articles to Taiwan that it already enjoys with Ukraine. For example, rather than demilitarizing hundreds of harpoon missiles or putting them into deep storage, the Pentagon could utilize a Taiwan drawdown authority and make any modernizations or necessary certifications and send these missiles along with their associated launchers to Taiwan. We should also learn from the first two Taiwan Strait crises where President Eisenhower dramatically increased American combat power on and around the island. This means increasing the size and frequency of American active duty and National Guard rotations on Taiwan and giving them the tools they need to help put Chinese amphibious assault ships at the bottom of the Taiwan Strait. <coughs> We can complete these steps within the Davidson window. In concert with the top line increase, we can pay for it by reducing the size of DOD's civilian workforce, larger than the Army, the Joint Staff, the Office of Secretary of Defense, the overall number of flag and general officers, and the fast-growing DEI bureaucracy. We can recycle valuable assets that contribute nothing to war fighting, like golf courses, we can resurrect the 2015 Defense Business Board study of DOD's core business practices, which identified a path to saving $125 billion over five years. More than enough to build 
both the anti-Navy and the Navy the nation needs. In other words, we don't lack options, we lack leadership. We lack leadership in the Pentagon capable of bending the bureaucracy to their will in service of a defense strategy that prioritizes hard power. And we lack leadership in the White House that understands the paradox at the heart of deterrence, that to avoid war, you must convince your adversary that you are both capable and willing to wage war. If we ignore hard lessons about hard power, if we continue down this utopian path of disarmament, or if we allow the fear of escalation to dominate our decisions, we will feed Xi's appetite for conquest and we will invite war itself by choosing instead to put an anti-Navy and Xi's path, we can deter war in the short term and buy time to build a Navy that defeats communism over the long term. Thank you, and I'm happy to entertain some questions.